Let's open our Bibles, if you will, please, to the book of Hebrews, chapter 7. <clears throat> Hebrews 7, ladies, you in the back there. Hebrews chapter 7, and let's read the first three verses today. <clears throat> For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. The last verse in chapter 6, verse 20 there, said that Jesus, quote, was made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. Notice that here in chapter 7, verse 3, it tells us that uh, Melchizedek was made like unto the Son of God. They weren't one and the same, but they typified each other in a few particulars. Melchizedek is rather an, an um, a mysterious, enigmatic character in the scriptures. Very little is told to us about him uh, or where he originated. Um, a man said to be without father, without mother, as verse 3 says, uh, who abideth a priest continually is quite a character to be, to, to, to put it mildly. This is why the Mormon cult and perhaps the the Masonic order as well, have made Melchizedek effectively their patron saint because so little is known about him. He's a mystery. And he had divine authority, apparently, to bless Abraham, as verse 1 tells us, and he had the right to receive tithes from Abraham, according to verse 2, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, and so forth. And uh, very little is revealed to us about Melchizedek, but I will insist that he and Christ were not one and the same. He wasn't just another uh, Old Testament preview or, or appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ, like the fourth person in the fiery furnace in the book of Daniel, chapter 3. And uh, his identity, there in verses 1 and 2, tell us, uh, are given to us, by these terms, first of all, King of Salem, then King of Righteousness, King of Salem, King of Peace. The name Melchizedek comes from two Hebrew words, meaning King and Peace, or Righteousness, King of Righteousness. <coughs> and the name of the town over which he was and is the king means Peace, Salem. Uh, Solomon, the son of peace. This is simply a different spelling of the same uh, Hebrew word. Jerusalem means the city of peace. That's been the most, it's funny, a great irony that the city that means the city of peace has been the most fought over piece of territory in the history of planet Earth. So why would it be called the city of peace? Um, David fought against it in 2 Samuel 5. He ruled in Hebron for seven, year, or seven years and then ruled in, uh, to move his kingdom to Jerusalem for the next 33 years. A total of 40 years David was, was king. The Egyptian king Pharaoh Necho came against it in 607 BC, uh, but he was blocked by the Jews under King Josiah. We read about King Josiah in 2 Kings 23. Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians invaded it, 586 B.C. Cyrus and the Persians rebuilt it after the Babylonian captivity, 536 B.C. It was torn up again under the Maccabees in 70 B.C. And uh, the, the extra books in the Catholic Bible, called the Apocrypha books, uh, give us the historic account of some of those wars, although they're not considered um, canonical, part of the inspired scriptures by the Jews. But they nevertheless have some historic value. It was rebuilt again by Herod, 
um, in 30 BC. It was destroyed again by Titus and the Romans, 70 AD. It was rebuilt by the Roman Emperor Hadrian about 120 AD. It was destroyed again by the Muslim Omar Khattab, 637 AD. It was rebuilt again by the European Catholic Crusaders in 1099 AD. And then it was ruined again by Saladin and the Muslim Turks in 1187 AD. It was liberated away from the Turkish Muslim rule by a British general named Edmund Allenby in 1918, following the end of World War I. And the modern state of Israel was officially established in May of 1948 after World War II. It took five to six million Jews being exterminated by the Nazi party to generate enough sympathy among the United Nations, early young United Nations, to establish the state of Israel. Talk about people who have to be moved by great tragedies to do one good thing. Otherwise, the United Nations has no point to exist in existence. Amen. Jerusalem was recognized by the United States as the true and proper capital of Israel in 2018 mm. by President Amen. Donald J. Oh. Trump. Yes. Amen. <laughs> uh, it was opposed, that, that action was opposed by all the Muslim states. It was opposed by the Catholic Pope. It was opposed by Hindus <coughs> and Muslims uh, throughout the world. It was opposed by every liberal, left-leaning uh, citizen or politician. Uh, who are all anti-Semites in their heart. And uh, that move is opposed by Muslims as recently as right now. Yeah. yeah. And right now also. And right now too. <laughs> Muslims hate the Jew. And I mentioned in our church hour, there's anti-Semitism all around the world, even in places where there are no Jews living. But they've been taught from their childhood up to despise the Jew, to hate the existence of the Jew. You look at uh, in Lebanon and Syria and their school children are <clears throat> taught geography and their maps uh, have the dotted outline of the state of Israel and it's referred to as the occupied territory. It's not even referred to as the state of Israel. It's considered to be uh, taken over by enemies right now. They do not recognize the legitimacy of the state of Israel. But God doesn't recognize the legitimacy of Islam. <laughs> so, well, that's harsh language, but it's true. Yeah. It's true. And nor should you. Nor should you. I'll show you one verse if I can find it. This is off the top of my head, so forgive me if I look for a scripture that I can't come up with. Go back to Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14. And look at the last verse of Zechariah 14, verse 21. Well, actually, verse 20. In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord. And the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. And all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and seethe therein. And in that, notice this, in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Aren't the so-called Palestinians derived or descended from the Canaanites? The Canaanites were those who dwelt in hence the name of the country, the land of Canaan, because the Canaanites dwelt there, and God told Israel to go in and drive them out. And if you can extrapolate that the modern Arab descendants come from the Canaanites and the Philistines and all of the enemies of Israel during the time of their kings, then it's not difficult to say God's going to eliminate all the non-Jewish invaders, all the non-Jewish strangers don't belong there. <coughs> The Canaanites were descended, hence the name, from Noah's son, uh, um, Ham, and his descendant, Canaan, his son, Canaan. 
and they, they fathered the African race of people, and they mixed out of their area in the Middle East with the Shemites there, and produced entire new race of people called the Canaanites, the Philistines, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and all of those other ites that God told the Jews to wipe out. Uh, that land doesn't belong to them. They have the entire continent of Africa to dwell in, Egypt southward. And the book of Psalms refers to Egypt as the land of Ham. That means Africa. And the far east, the land of Shem, the Shemites, the far west, the land of the Japhethites, the white folks. That's you and me. For, well, except for the Koreans here. You're Shemites. But, um, so they don't belong there. But God's going to wipe out, uh, rather drive out, all the Muslim people, the Arabs who don't belong there. Uh, back to Hebrews chapter 7. So, Israel is, uh, Jerusalem is the most fought over territory, the most, most fought over city in the history of the world. Uh, and it's hard to imagine why such a city would be named in connection with the word peace. But the word of God gives us the answer. Uh, I need to have you turn to a number of texts with me. First of all, go to Psalm 76. Psalm 76. It's right after the book of Psalm 75. <laughs> Psalm 76. If you go to Psalm 77, you've gone too far. <laughs> Psalm 76, look at verses 1, 2, and 3. In Judah is God known. His name is great in Israel. In Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. There break he the arrows of the bow, the shield and the sword and the battle, Selah. We spent over three years studying the book of Psalms. Every time that word Selah appears, it has some immediate connection to the second advent of Christ, the return of Christ, the kingdom of Christ, the rule of Christ, the, or the end of the tribulation leading up to that time. Go forward to the book of Haggai. Ooh. Not too many churches in Ontario preaching out of the book of Haggai today. <laughs> But I am going to run into at least one, one verse there. Haggai, Haggai uh, chapter 2. I'll call your attention to one verse there. Verse 9. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, if you will, go back to Psalms again, Psalm 46. Psalm 46. You notice there verses 8 and 9. Psalm 46, 8 and 9. Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder, he burneth the chariot in the fire. Now I want you to run forward to the book of Isaiah, chapter 2. Isaiah 2. And Isaiah 2, verse 4. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That verse, or most of that verse, has been taken from the Bible and used by the United Nations on plaques and statues, beginning with the words, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Well, they leave out the qualifying clause. He shall judge among the nations. That is necessary first. Uh, man, every, every unsafe politician worships this concept called peace. That's the God of all politicians is the word peace. We're for peace. Hitler was for peace. He wanted a peace of Poland. He wanted a peace of Yugoslavia. He wanted a peace of lots of countries. And politicians say we're, we're for peace. 
we want to get help folks get along with each other. And you cannot have peace without the Prince of Peace here Amen. to enforce it. Amen. And so when you leave off the, the qualifier, he shall judge among the nations, then the rest of that verse is simply the fruitless, pointless effort of man to bring about peace, to create peace, to make peace, to cause peace, to force peace, even if we have to kill people to get to it. That's the way all, all governments of men end up um, being run. It's, you think that insanity would, would be more obvious to some people that what politicians keep promising they never deliver on. And the thing that upsets people, well, like we're witnessing it now here in the United States, we're witnessing a president who's actually fulfilling some of the promises he made during the campaign. People can't stand that. We're used to politicians you know, bloviating about things they're going to do, what they'd like to do, we all get excited and vote for them, and then nothing changes. Um, it, it's hard to imagine how someone would be able to come um, in 2020 and say, uh, I'm going to do better than the last guy did. When the last guy has done better than the previous 10, 10 presidents have done. Yeah, yeah. I guess, I guess unemployment uh, being at an all-time low doesn't mean anything to some people. I guess the increase in manufacturing jobs returning to the United States doesn't mean anything to some people. I guess the, the uh, increased um, funding and financing of the military doesn't mean anything to some people. It means a lot to me as an American. And I guess the, you know, the, the stock market all-time record highs and people making more profit of investments and a number of other um, income streams than ever before doesn't mean anything to some people. But as a citizen, it means a lot to me. Uh, the reason for Jerusalem's name is clear. There will be no permanent peace on this earth anywhere until the Lord goes forth and he fights for Jerusalem, just as he did in the days of Joshua. Go, go, if you will, to the book of Zechariah again. Zechariah 14, again. Zechariah 14, bless you. Zechariah 14, verses uh, 1 through... One through four, one through three. Zechariah 14. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. Your God speaking to Jerusalem. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem, on the east, and on the, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall be moved toward the north, and half of it toward the south. There will not be any lasting peace until the Lord Jesus comes and defends the state of Israel, the nation of Israel, the Jew, in the land that God had once given to Abraham. As an American, as a Christian, as a Gentile, born again on the New Testament, I have no interest in living in Jerusalem. Hmm. It doesn't have any appeal to me. But that's the nation God, that, that's the land God gave to a certain um, physical lineage of people from Abraham on is that this is going to be your possession forever. And we mentioned our, our Wednesday night Bible class this last week that the city of Jerusalem and the nation of Israel, or Palestine rather, never had a kingdom or any capital city in it except when the Jews lived there and Jerusalem was the capital under the kings. There was never any Palestinian capital there was never any capital of Arabs or Muslims. They've never had a city that was their capital city there. It's all been land they're farming and living in, but didn't do anything with. You know, Dennis Prager is a 
conservative commentator I like, a conservative Jew, Michael Medved also, two very conservative Jews, very uh, observant Jews in synagogues, neither one of them born again, sadly. But Dennis Prager said, you can go to Israel. Oh, actually, he's the one that I first heard say they're speaking Old Testament Hebrew in Israel today. In the 800s, about the 9th century, that there was a group, group of Jews called the Masoretes. They're Masoretic scribes, I guess descended from the scribes and the rabbis uh, to protect the, and safeguard the scriptures. And Hebrew has no alphabet, has no vowels. It's 22 letters in their alphabet and no vowels. And so context has to determine the meaning of that word, what that word's intended to mean. We have A-E-I-O-U and in our, in our uh, language, and most languages have some form of vowel system, but Hebrew had none. So they created this system of, of vowels called uh, vowel points, little dots and dashes underneath the letters to create a system of vowel pronunciations. They're called the Masoretic vowel points. We learned those in Bible school in Hebrew when we studied Hebrew. But they are speaking Hebrew now and writing Hebrew in Israel now without the vowel points. They just dropped them. They don't need them. Context seems to determine for a Jew, to another Jew, what the one means when he's trying to say something. And so Dennis Prager commented, they're speaking Old Testament Hebrew today in Israel. He said an Old Testament prophet like Jeremiah could be resurrected and he could go to a hotel in Israel and watch Saturday morning cartoons and actually enjoy them. <laughs> because the language has changed so very little. And then Michael Medved said, when you go to Israel, you get up on the top of the mountain, you can see green, where they've, they've brought vegetation and greened up the entire country by importing millions of trees and bushes. Uh, and the, the uh, uh, importation of plants and trees and bushes and shrubbery has this reciprocal effect. It attracts more rainfall on it. And he said, you can stand on, a, on the top of a mountain in Israel and look off in the distance, and where the green stops, that's where the border of Israel stops. And you would think the Muslim, or the, the Arabs, would have enough sense to say, well, we can do the same thing in our country. You know, you know the reason they don't do it? Very simple. It would be admitting that the Jew was smarter than we were. It would be to admit that they were right and we were wrong. That that they had a little more insight, a little more wisdom than we've ever had. I, I can't understand someone who would say, God's all finished with the Jew, when the identity of the Jew is so prominent in the world, the achievements of the Jew. And when we say the Jew, we're not talking about it in a pejorative sense, like a criticism. We mean, we mean it in the most respectful term. Because that's the one... If there was ever any superior race in the scriptures, it wouldn't be the white man. It would be the Jew. That's the one race that God has blessed and had an affection for and fondness for since the day he called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. Um, Jerusalem is the city of peace because that's where all wars will finally come to an end. God defends Israel against their enemies, as he will do at the end of the millennium, when people rebel against God and make one last, try to make one last stand against God and rebel against him, and he just comes and wipes them out. The Bible doesn't give us even much description about that battle, but they will. It's, it's hard to imagine people living under perfect uh, conditions in, and peace, for a thousand years, and the peace of Jesus enforced by the Lord himself, and millions of believers now uh, made immortal, incorruptible into his glorified image, roaming around the world. There won't be anywhere a, 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 a flesh and blood person can go without running into an image of Jesus Christ. And every saint will be transformed like him. And, and yet... <laughs> 
think about, um, you, can, you can sort of understand what's going to happen at the end of the thousand years. I mean, you think of how people react to goodness and decency in society now. America was a lot more peaceful and uh, happy and prosperous in the 1950s than they are in the 21st century. People were decent, they were virtuous, they were clean, they were moral. Even your unsaved neighbor was someone you could trust. Now I wouldn't trust half the Christians to watch my property for me. It's, and um, laws were much more were stringent and, and enforced. And when laws are enforced, people don't have a lot of wiggle room. They have to behave themselves. And the, the nature of man says, you don't trust me. That's why you put all these terrible rules on me to live by and follow. And the reason uh, parents that say don't trust their teenage kids is because you can't be trusted. <laughs> really. I couldn't be trusted when I was a kid. Now I'm telling on myself, I, just, I probably did things I don't want my mom and dad to find out about, and they're in the room right now. <laughs> <laughs> but they couldn't be trusted when they were teenagers either. They probably did things they'd be embarrassed to have their mom and dad find out about. It's like all of you did too. Don't yeah, look at right. me like, not me, yeah. Pastor Trapp. You better believe it's you. <laughs> of course it's you. I'm looking at you. You're the one I'm aiming at. So, but people say, you don't, don't trust me. Here, I got to think about this. And I've said this before. The atheist argument is, why does God allow so much wickedness and evil in the world? If there's a, if there's a loving God like you Christians claim, why is there so much evil in the world? And why is there so much suffering in the world? Well, I can give you three reasons why. Number one, you have a free will, and you've made some bad decisions in life, and you suffer the consequences of them. Number two, the next guy has a free will too, and he's made bad decisions. You might be in the, in the way, and his, his bad decisions affect you. Number three, you suffer in this world because of this bad decisions your ancestors made, right? If you're, think about what Adolf Hitler did to that one little style of mustache. <laughs> really? <laughs> Charlie Chaplin wore it, others wore it. It was pretty common back in the 1920s and 30s. But once Adolf Hitler wore it, he had got a bad reputation. You haven't seen anybody wearing that little middle <laughs> nose mustache ever since that time. <laughs> and anyone who did so would be, so, oh, you're a Nazi sympathizer. That's how bizarre, yeah, idiotic the world is now. I thought about wearing one, trying to bring it back, just to see what would happen. <laughs> you know, kind of just comb my hair forward like Hitler always did. <laughs> but... Uh, but so your, your, your father, your mother, your grandparents, they did something that, that they got, gained a bad reputation for, and then their children suffer that legacy, and grandchildren as well. Or God cursed the ground, uh, uh, cursed the ground for thy sake, thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and when he uh, cursed it for Adam and Eve's sin. There's a curse on the ground, and uh, people... Uh, marry and mix with each other, and all kinds of genetic problems have uh, been the result. And you and I, how many generations since the time of Adam have received a, a flawed gene, flawed genetics, DNA, all the transmission of bad <coughs> effects and disease, and uh, which you had no uh, nothing to do with, but you're nevertheless the recipient of some bad Genetics, perhaps. Something that was generated by your parents, your grandparents, great-grandparents. And so there's a lot of suffering in the world because of the wickedness, the sin, the free will of man that's coming back to haunt him now. And um, so if God were to step in, every time you're about to make a dumb move and a bad decision, you'd accuse him of being a tyrant. He doesn't trust me. Why doesn't God back off and let me work things out for myself? So let's suppose God 
God uh, did back off, let you make a bunch of dumb decisions. Well, God doesn't care. He should step in. See, God can't win with some people. Yeah. No matter what God does, there's going to be somebody that accuses him of, of, uh, of, un, uh, of wickedness. But anyway, back to our lesson thing. Uh, we read there in Isaiah chapter 2, they beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Um, he will cause all the nations to break their uh, armaments, break them down and melt them and convert them into farming tools. That would be a real time of, of peace, agricultural, from weapons of war to tools of agriculture. Melchizedek is plainly a type of Christ, and um, the most outstanding or the most salient uh, thing about him are the two interpretations of his name. First of all, uh, king of Salem means king of righteousness. And secondly, king of Salem means king of peace. In that order, one must come before the other. Christ's first coming was to bring righteousness. Go, if you will, to the book of Matthew, chapter 5. Matthew 5, and one verse there, verse 20. Jesus said, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Look at Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Uh, Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And let's read the first few verses there. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that he might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law, not the end of the law, period, but the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith, speaking on this wise, and so forth. And uh, jump to farther, verse. Now uh, yeah, that's that's enough right there for that section. Christ's first coming, he came to establish righteousness. And that was only uh, available, only possible, because of his death for the sake of sinners. He died on behalf of the sinner. He took the judgment that the sinner should have received from God. He bore the, the, the burden of your sin all the way to the cross of Calvary, and that sin was then effectively punished by his blood being shed on your behalf. He was your substitute. He died for your sake. He was your stand-in so that you could go free. Everyone seems to understand the idea of a substitute, whether it's a, a stunt man in a movie, it's a, a, a designated a base runner in baseball, any things of that nature. Everyone understands the idea of a substitute doing the hard work while the other person gets the benefit from it. Some guy wins an Academy Award for being a great action hero, and some other stuntman did all the all the hard work, right? Mm -hmm. They have they have their own separate Academy Awards for the behind the scenes people, the producers and the stunt people and the work. Nobody cares about those. <clears throat> and um, the, the the one on screen, he gets all the accolades and glory for. So the titles of Melchizedek reveal Christ's ministry for the first and second advents. First of all, king of righteousness, verse 2, and then secondly, after that, king of peace. At his second coming, he will finally bring lasting peace <coughs> to the world. There is no lasting peace in the world now. There's only uh, ceasefires of different durations of time. Otherwise, there is no lasting peace. Go, if you will, just forward a few pages to the book of James, chapter 3. James 3. And 
And notice there are verses 17 and 18. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Isaiah chapter 32. I'm just about done for today. Isaiah 32. Isaiah 32, verse 17. And the work of righteousness shall be peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. So, righteousness must come before there's any peace. When the angels appeared to the shepherds, Luke chapter 2, they said, uh, For unto you was born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Uh, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. There will be no peace on this earth until God receives glory. And that came through and by the Lord Jesus Christ. When you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are giving God all the glory you can possibly give Him by receiving what He's offered to you as a sinner in need. He gets the glory, you get salvation, and peace is the, the fruit afterwards. But until the, until the world receives Jesus Christ as their Savior, they won't really know any peace. They won't know any peace. They can convince them, tell themselves that they're living a peaceful life, but all the records and statistics of high blood pressure and heart attacks and heart failure and any number of uh, suicide rates. You know, the two groups in the world who have some of the highest rates of suicide, professional occupations have two of the highest rates of suicide, psychologists and psychiatrists. <clears throat> they have two of the highest rates of suicide uh, among professional occupations in the world. They're supposedly helping other people find peace of mind, and they have none themselves. They have none themselves. And all the statistics uh, confirm that. But let's stop right there. Um, without righteousness in the soul, there's going to be no peace in the heart and the mind. Uh, and without the righteousness of Christ uh, establishing a righteous rule over the world, there will be no world peace one day. 